Sounds like he's taking the lashings. <laughs> if you would, go ahead and, and turn in your Bibles with me to Judges uh, chapter 21, verse 25, and, and let me kind of just set the stage of, of where we're going to be at. Uh, last week, as we, we looked at our, our message last week, and, and we saw that the Israelite people had just been released from captivity, and as they were traveling to the wilderness, and they... They lost all of their comfort from what they had in captivity. Because now, instead of them having or knowing that they had food in front of them and that they had a place to stay and they didn't have to worry about what they were going to be doing at work because they already knew, being that they're out in the wilderness now, they have lost all of those comforts. But the main question that we came upon last week is whenever the Israelite people asked, can God? And so today we're, we're actually going to kind of jump forward just a little bit to over into to Judges here and see what happens after they have proclaimed the promise that God had given them, that he had, had released them from captivity. And we see that they actually come upon some un uncomfortable times. But I want you to understand that some of this came because of generations that came after those who were released from captivity. Just to, to kind of put it in, in kind of perspective for us, those of us who were born in the 1970s and before, that means that you're... Somewhere in your 40s or older. Uh, but whenever we were growing up, we first had to survive being born to mothers that carried us in their wombs and they smoked cigarettes and they drank alcoholic beverages. They ate, they ate tuna from a can. They took aspirin. They ate blue cheese dressing. And we survived it. And, and then immediately after that, we were put in cribs that were brightly colored with lead-based paint. And then as we started growing, we had no child-proof lid bottles, we had no child-proof cabinet doors, nothing was child-proof, but yet we survived. Then when it came to, to riding in cars, we didn't put on seat belts. Even on a, a good, warm, sunny day, riding in the back of a pickup truck was just the greatest thing that could happen in your life. We would leave home of a morning and, and not come back until the street light came on. And we were okay. They didn't have phones to get up with us. We survived. We fell out of trees and broke bones and got cuts and scrapes and got some of our teeth knocked out. But there were no lawsuits. At the age of 10, most of us got BB guns. We went outside and we, we threw sticks and rocks and everything. And, and even though they told us, we didn't lose very many eyes. You know, we would spend hours building our, our go-karts from scraps that we found laying around the yard. And then as we tested it on the hill, we would immediately realize that we forgot an important component of the go-kart. The brakes. Now, now, I don't know if, if many of you, it, it probably took you a little less uh, time to, to figure out, but after a few times, I realized that I had a problem I had to solve, and so we found a way to do that. We fast forward. In the past 50 years, those people have been a, some of the 
largest group that has made inventions and has solved problems. We survived. We beat the odds. You look at the children of today and it's like they're, they're wrapped in bubble wrap. You know, that's the difference in the culture in which we grew up and they are now growing up. But we're no different than the people of Israel. See, just like you and I, they had freedom and failures and success and responsibility. And we learned how to deal with it all. Just like they had to learn how to deal with the problems they encountered in the wilderness. Now, every time I read the story of Exodus, I always ask the question, how can the people of Israel complain like they do? How can they be so ignorant and so stupid and so forgetful that the God of the universe has just tossed around the most powerful man on the face of the earth like a child toting a rag doll? I mean, they rocked his nation, God and his people. Yet, Israel's response to this spectacular de deliverance from Egypt is not mainly praise, worship, and a wholehearted trust. They respond with grumbling, complaining, mummering, and quarreling. Spiritual amnesia had quickly set in and covered the eyes of Israel's hearts. They had forgotten God's gracious and miraculous deliverance that he had just provided them. And as the next generation came along, they remembered less and less of what God had done for their nation. So that brings us up to our scripture here in, in Judges chapter 21 and verse 25. So if you would, just please stand with me for the reading of, of this verse. And God's word says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did whatever seemed right to him. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come to this part of your service, Father, to allow your spirit to speak to us, Father, we just ask that you would take and you would just clear our minds and clear our hearts and that your Holy Spirit would just speak to us. Father, we are a dying people seeking a living message, a living message that is from you. Father, let the words that come from my lips not be mine, but of yours. For it's in your holy and precious name that we ask these things. Amen. You know, just like we, we kind of did last week, we kind of went to the end of the story, and then we had to jump back and ask the question, how did Israel get to this point? How did Israel, a nation that God had, had chosen through a man named Abraham and, and God had given him a promise that he would raise up a nation and that his, his um, offspring would be so numerous. How could they get to this point that they'd done what they thought was right in their eyes and not what was right in God in a godly way? Israel who was a nation that was enslaved for 100, 400 years, was freed from the Egyptians. So how did we get here? And it also leaves me with the question in the same way as I look around in our world today, how did we get to where we are today? In order for us to answer that question, we have to go back to the beginning. So we have to look back in, into the book of Joshua. Now Joshua, who was a strong man of God, and we have some folks here uh, just like that today, some strong people uh, who are planted firmly in God and in His Word. But, but here Joshua is, he is coming up to the end of his life, and, and where we're going to here is, is Joshua, as he's about to die, he comes to the Israelites and he says, Look, listen. I've got one little last message, one little gold nugget of information to give you here. It 
says, I'm about to leave you, and when I go, I can't keep your faith for you. So here's the last little bit of information that he has, and it's, it's in Joshua 24, verse 15. And it says, But if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, choose for yourselves today, which you will worship, the God's your fathers worship beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. As for me and my family, we will worship God. Now here is Joshua saying, all right, folks, here is your choice. All right, you can either worship the God that your fathers have or the, the God of the land that you just came from or either you can worship the one true God. Here's your choice. Which one is it going to be? And, and as we see there in verse 16, he says, we will certainly, the people says this, we will certainly not abandon the Lord to worship other gods. So here they are telling Joshua that they would never serve any other god. Why would they tell Joseph, or Joshua this? I think I said Joseph just to say, God, I apologize, it's Joshua. But why would they tell Joshua this? For one reason. They remember the, the God that they encountered while they wandered around for 40 years in the wilderness. They remember the plagues that God had put upon Egypt while they were in slavery. And how God used those for Pharaoh to finally say, here, Go, get out of here. We're done. Leave. They also remembered the God who parted the sea whenever they got to it, where he divided the waters and they were able to walk through on dry land. And while they were wandering around for those 40 years, there was no food. And God said, hey, don't worry about it. I've got something for you. Here, I'll give you manna. All right, and as we, we looked last week, all right, manna was angel's food. They witnessed that. They witnessed how God preserved them through the wilderness. They witnessed when they got to the town of Jericho and, and the wall stood between them and the city in which they were supposed to take. And they remember God's instructions. I want you to walk around the city each day. Just walk around it one time. But on the seventh day, you're going to walk around seven times. And they experienced, as the trumpets blew and they shouted with a loud roar, they experienced the walls falling. See, they remembered that. And this is what I call a, a first-generation Christian. Someone who has experienced God in their life, and God has made himself very real to them. You know, after our, our students had come back from the ark, you know, we kind of shared with you about some of our experiences, and I can tell you that the night before we left was a, a God moment for some of them. God made himself real to them on that trip. And that was evidence that as we got back a couple weeks later and and several of them said, hey, I need to make Jesus Lord of my life. And others who said, you know what, I hadn't been living the life for God that I have. And I need to do it. See, God made himself real to them. And I also like to call first generation Christians also 2 a.m. Christians. Because you can take and you can pick up your phone at any time, day or night, two or three in the morning, and you can pick it up and you can call them and, and they're there for you. They're there, to, they'll pray for you. When something goes wrong in your family, all right, they'll pull the, the frozen lasagna out of the refrigerator and bring it to you and give you directions typed out on a pretty piece of ivory colored paper so that you can follow them. They have experienced God. They ooze God from their life. 
their bones even speak out for God. That's what a first generation Christian is. This is what the Israelites who have just come from captivity, that's who they are. But then I want you to, to look down just a little bit in Joshua 24, verse 31 there. And it says, Israel worshipped the Lord throughout Joshua's lifetime and during the lifetimes of the elders who outlived Joshua and who had experienced all the works the Lord had done for Israel. Here we come to what I call a second generation Christian. Someone who has, has heard about all the great things that God has done. All right, maybe in, in your life, in my life, maybe it's our grandparent or either our parents. And, and we remember something that they told us that they have experienced a time where God made himself real for them. And what we do is we take in, we live off of borrowed faith. We borrowed their faith. See, we borrow their excitement for, for God and, and for what He's done in their life, but they never really have experienced a God making Himself real moment. See, maybe for you, maybe as, as you come to Sunday school and maybe you're living off of the borrowed faith of your Sunday school teacher, or maybe you're living off of the, the faith of our pastor or, or one of your other leaders. So you come in and you've heard that God can move the mountains, but that's for people that has a strong faith. But maybe your faith is, is just strong enough so that you can kick a pebble down the road. Because you've not experienced that God real moment. Maybe you're starting to say that I'm just going to kind of do what I feel right in my own worldview. And though you, you said, you know, Jesus, I want to make you Lord of my life, you never get past that point of making him truly Lord of your life. You're just kind of Jesus on the surface and not into the depths of who you really are. Now that is where the Israelite people now find themselves, being led by a second generation Christian. All the people that had experienced God's power firsthand has died. All the elders have died. And all the people that have walked through the desert have died. All the people that saw the manna has died, and all the people who walked through the Red Sea on dry land has now died. And suddenly, the next generation of Israelites is coming forward, and they are left with who for leadership? They are left with a second generation Christian as their leader. Then we jump on over to Judges chapter 2. In verse 10, and it says, That whole generation was also gathered to their ancestors. It's the second generation of Christians have now gone on. After them, another generation rose up who did not know the Lord or the works he had done for Israel. See, Israel is now faced with another generation. Think of it this way. No longer is the faith of our grandparents left. No longer is the faith of our parents left. No longer is the faith of our pastors left. The only faith that is left is the second generation Christian's faith. Uh-oh. If you and I are second generation Christians, then our faith is no longer as appealing as our grandparents' faith once looked. 
Our faith isn't quite as active as our grandparents' faith once was. And so now they're, this generation is looking at us and, and they're walking away and we don't understand why. And that generation we'll call this morning the third generation Christians. There are more of them here than we realize. They will attend church because they have to. They will, will show up to get hatched matched and dispatched, all right? And so that you, you kind of know, all right, they, they show up and they get baptized, married, and buried. Hatched, matched, and dispatched. And the truth is, they just didn't see enough change in our life and we have, and we are losing them. So what do we do? How does that affect change in my life? How do we help these third generation Christians? The first thing is we have to be willing to get uncomfortable ourselves. If you think that your faith is the equivalent of sitting in a a lazy boy chair and and you never have to get up because you got the remote on the side of the, the armchair and you never have to get up to change the channel. Folks, let me tell you, you're wrong. If you thought that it's okay, now I'm saved. I have accepted Jesus, so now I'm just going to wait. You're wrong. Folks, you better get uncomfortable. You better get out of that recliner and start running a 5K race. We've got to stop giving this generation a comfortable, born faith because that is a faith that they never want to follow. You and I should be uncomfortable to the point because there are adults that grew up in church and have never really experienced the life-changing power of Jesus Christ. You and I should also be uncomfortable because there are children and teenagers who are living uh, within walking distance of this church that doesn't even know that someone loves them and that someone cares for them, much less know that there is a greater love than what we can give to them. See, they don't even know that self-worth comes from being created in the image of God and not what they can provide to the world, whether it's through, through sexual relations or, or whether it's through seeing how many likes or, or friends that they can get on Snapchat or Instagram. Folks, we should be uncomfortable knowing that the amount of people who considers themselves to be non-religious has doubled from 2009 to 2019. Now that's, let me just kind of tell you, tell you who those folks are. Those are the ones that said, you know what? I don't believe that there's any God of any type. Basically, atheists are agnostics. They doubled from 2009 to 2019. They went from 9% in 2009 to 19% in 2019. 30% of those folks are millennials. That's our older teenagers into young adults. 30% of those, the largest group in those statistics. And Barna, who done the research on that, say that that number is set to grow even more with Generation Z. Does that make you uncomfortable? It should. We should be very uncomfortable. We need to be uncomfortable. We need to stop sitting back and allowing the world to go on around us while we create our own little bubbles and say, here I am, I'm safe. Folks, it's not about being safe and being comfortable. God has called us to something greater. Salvation is free, but following Christ will cost you something. The second way that we help this generation is to believe 
what we say that we believe. Probably sounds weird, but let me say it again. Believe what you say you believe. If we actually believe what we say we believe, then it should change us. What if we took John 3.16, for God so loved the world. Folks, you're in this world. God loves you. What if we start giving that message out? What if we start believing it? What if we start believing where Jesus said, love your neighbors, love your enemies, love one another. What if we started believing that? Not just saying it, but believing it. If we just take a couple of those things and, and start truly acting on our beliefs of them, how much change would we see in the world around us? What if we actually believe that Jesus cares? We say, I believe this, then show me. Show me you believe. You know, the words that we sometimes mumble are if someone gets what they deserve should never come from the mouth of a Christian. If we believe that God is who He is and that He gave everything to us, how did God show us His love? By sending His Son, Jesus Christ. How did Jesus show us His love? By willingly going to die on a cross to save us from our sins. We just gave remembrance of it right here this morning. We need to die to ourselves for each other. If we start believing what we say we believe, then those jokes that we tell that, that are, are funny no longer become funny to us. Men, the things that you say about women around your sons no longer become interesting and funny. So we need to stop saying that we believe it and start acting on us believing it. You know, we're really bad about following the Christian values but we get way bent out of shape whenever people who never ascribe to the Christian values fail to keep the Christian values. Folks, we need to stop expecting an organization that never labeled themselves as Christians to keep Christian values when we as Christian organizations fail to keep the Christian values ourselves. We need to stop getting upset about a halftime show and start getting upset all right, with the Christians who make NFL, their God. What if we got mad at Christians for failing to be a Christian rather than non-Christians failing to be Christian? You know, we think, well, we're doing good. Drop a few bucks in the offering plate. I bring my kids to church except for when a sporting event conflicts with it. I worship God every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. with my voice and then worship almost everything else the rest of the week. I know it can be uncomfortable, but hashtag sorry, not sorry, I don't care. See, we've got to become uncomfortable. We've got to start doing the things that we say that we believe and showing them that, hey, we really believe them. What if we allowed it to change us? Because what's the cost if we don't? Let's look at Judges. Uh, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. It says, The Israelites did what was evil in the Lord's sight. They worshiped the Baals and abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of Egypt. They followed other gods from the surrounding peoples and bowed down. I'm sorry, and bowed down to them. They angered the Lord, for they abandoned Him and worshipped Baal 
and the Astrashes. Fourth generation Christians. Maybe they're a little bit spiritual. But not only is Jesus not their Savior or their Lord, they haven't even experienced any of the things that he's promised us. What's at stake? It's our children and our grandchildren. And we are losing an entire generation. You know, at some point, some loud mouth Christian is going to stand up and say, let's blame culture. It was culture's fault. Let's blame the rap music. Because we don't want to feel responsible for anything. Let's just blame anything and everything else because it's not our fault. But let me tell you, it's your fault. And it's my fault because we chose to give them a faith that was not living for. We refused to model a faith that was worth them living for. We chose to give them a faith that was not attractive to them. And we think that an easy faith, a comfortable faith, is the thing that is going to make them attractive to it. No. Did they see the fruit in your life? Church, it's our fault. So what happens to the Israelites? They spend the next eight years back in captivity. Folks, here is a people who has just been released from captivity of 400 years, who have experienced... Mighty works of God. And yet, they fall back in to serving as slaves for the nations that surrounded them for eight years. But there's some good news here. Look at Judges 3, verse 9. It says, The Israelites cried out to the Lord. So the Lord raised up Nathaniel, son of Kenez, Caleb's younger brother, as a deliverer to save the Israelites. God heard their cry, and he raised up a deliverer. Folks, as the song, song Best News by Mercy Me says, that's not good news, that's the best news ever. That's the best news ever. I want you to know that there's hope. There is hope. And it's in you and in me. You and I could be the deliverer for this generation. First generation people. You have people that are looking at you. And they see the faith that you have and and they are loving, living off of borrowing faith from you. Let me tell you, don't let them live off of your borrowed faith. Help them get to a point so that they have faith of their own. I can remember Mark Hall Hall with Crashing crashing uh, Crowns. I'm getting tongue-tied. Whenever he was talking about the song between the altar and the door, about whenever you're at the altar, whenever you're in the midst of, of those who have a strong faith, Your faith seems to have a black and white picture to it. But somewhere between this altar and that door, it becomes gray. Folks, don't let that happen to those folks who are looking up to you. Help them experience a faith of their own. If you're a second generation Christian, let me tell you, don't stop. I know you want to be comfortable, but there's plenty of comfort whenever we meet our Creator. Don't stop now. Keep going. 
Why? Because others are watching you, and we need you. So as our music starts to play, and I go into prayer for us, I want you to go ahead and, and just bow your heads right there where you're at. I've got two questions that I want you to ponder this morning.